Good morning, everyone. So uh, let's start this session now, which, as you see, is called Helping People to Become More Effective Learners. Uh, the accent, by the way, is on more effective, because I'm not suggesting that people aren't learning, because, of course, we're learning all the time. But this session is going to particularly think about how can we help people to be even more effective than they are at the moment. And one of the difficulties, I think, with the word learning is that, of course, learning is a process, but it's a process like all processes, which leads to an outcome. And there's a tendency, of course, understandably, for us to pay much more attention to the outcome, in other words, the results, uh, than it is to pay to the process that led to those results. So the whole point today is not to think so hard about the outcomes, important though those are, but to concentrate far more on the process, which is so crucial, of course, because it leads to better or worse outcomes. So more about the process. But before I do that, um, I think it's important to say very quickly what I mean by the expression effective learning. You know, what is effective learning? As opposed to either ineffective learning or just learning. Uh, and so there are three things there. One is, of course, that the learning would stick for as long as it has to, which is not necessarily forever because uh, learning becomes redundant and events overtake it, etc. The second one is that it gets used appropriately, so the accent is on the use of whatever has been learnt, putting it to some practical, appropriate use, not inappropriate use, of course. And the third one is that when it's put to use, it makes a difference for the better. It's important to add for the better because, of course, if we just said it makes a difference, it could make a difference for the worse. So effective learning, those three things, sticks, uh, gets used appropriately, and when it's used, makes a difference for the better. So those are, that's what I mean by effective learning. And in a perfect world, and of course we know that the world is not perfect, sadly, then I think there are a number of things that effective learners would be both able and willing to do. It's important, I think, that we have an able and a willing. So in other words, they can do it, they have the skills and so on, but they also want to do it. So there's the motivation as well, able and willing. So here goes, these are in no order of importance except that I've saved possibly the most important one until last, it's last on the list. Um, but here goes, so if someone was an effective learner, how would we know they were? And uh, these, were the, these are the criteria, if you like, that I would use. And the first is they'd be able to describe their learning. Uh, either in writing or in words, of course. Um, in other words, should they choose to, they, the learning would be specific enough for them to be able to articulate it. And that's important, by the way, because, of course, it's only when we can describe what we've learned that other people can listen to it and benefit from it. And the, all the talk of creating learning schools or learning organizations or even learning societies it's fundamental to that idea that people are able to share their learning so that other people can benefit, reciprocal learning. So that's the first one. And interestingly, ineffective learners, even though they're learning all the time and so on, one of the things that they find it very difficult to do is to articulate precisely enough, convincingly enough, what they've learned. So there's an important criteria. Another one is they'd be able to quality assure their learning. That's important because learning, a lot of learning, particularly learning from experience, experiential learning, um, it's just as easy to learn the wrong things as it is to learn the right things. If you think about the bad habits that we've all acquired, those are things that we weren't born doing. You know, those are habits that we have learnt in just the same way we learn good habits. So it's quite clear if you look at human behavior, and when you grumble about someone's behavior because it's inconvenient to you in some way, it creates a problem, then of course you have to remember the person has learnt to behave like that, and there must in fact be some advantage to them in continuing to behave that way. Otherwise, presumably, they'd stop doing it and do something else. But the main point is that learning left unchecked, left to its own devices, as it were, can be dodgy. They, we, it's just as easy for people to learn unhelpful, inappropriate things as it is to learn 
whatever we would consider to be the right things. So there's wrong learning, there's right learning, and we need to check, really, by holding the learning up to the light, uh, quizzing it, scrutinizing it, comparing what one person's learnt against what another person has learnt, and so on. We just need to make sure that this is learning which is helpful, which is desirable, and so on. So that's the second point. Third point, people would be in a much better position than we usually are to transfer something learnt in one situation to a range of other situations, which may differ quite significantly from the original situation. If you, if you take your learning for granted, too much of your learning is probably in boxes or pigeonholes. Um, and that's fine so far as it goes, but of course, learning often can be useful across a whole spread, a whole range of situations, rather than just being confined to, you know, whatever originally led to that particular lesson, that particular piece of learning. So it's really, um, it's like um, massive added value if you can take a piece of learning from one situation and spread it and see how it can apply, possibly with slight modifications and adaptations to a whole range, a wider range of situations. That's classic added value. So that's another on the list. <clears throat> People, effective learners can learn two quite different ways. They can learn reactively. In other words, something happens, an experience, something nice, something nasty, whatever it might be, and after it's happened, they mull it over, think about it, review it, reflect on it, reach conclusions, so they draw some lessons from whatever happened to them, and then decide what to do better or differently. So that's reactive learning, because something had to happen first before the learning kicked in. But of course, quite a lot of um, learning isn't like that. It's proactive in the sense that we invite people to think in advance what they would like to learn, perhaps to set some targets or some objectives and then to work out how to achieve those things, how best to achieve them, and all the rest of it. So whenever you invite people to do uh, continuous professional development or to set any sort of development needs or objectives, that's an invitation to learn proactively. It's a different starting point. You're thinking about what you need to learn first and only then looking for the opportunities which are going to help you to learn whatever's on the list, as it were. So reactive learning, great. Proactive learning, great. We need both. And most people, left to their own devices, are kind of rely too often, I think, on uh, reactive learning rather than taking initiatives, taking responsibility for their own learning, and therefore doing more uh, proactive learning in addition to. They're ands, they're not either ors. And last on the list, I think probably the, arguably the most important one, is that effective learners would, would be able to, to think about what they'd learned, not just what they'd learned, but how they'd learned, and therefore continually or continuously improve the process. So they could gradually get better and better at learning, rather than just being stuck with whatever they're good at at the moment. Uh, that's, if you like, learning to learn. So there you are, so that's at the moment uh, what I mean by effective learning. Then some of the snags, if you like, with um, le leaving learning to run to its own devices and so on. So I'm arguing that learning would be uh, much better if we treated this as a skill uh, where people can be helped to develop the skill, hone and polish it, get better at it and so on. Become better equipped as learners from a whole range of experiences. Well, now, let's think of, if I try to drill down into what, what this means in the end, I think the trouble with learning, you see, is it's a rather vague thing, which it's hard to get hold of. And so I'm now going to try to reduce it, if you like, to a list of behaviors. And it should say et cetera, because there are more where these come from. These are not, this is not an exhaustive list. And so I'm trying to think, well, when we've got behaviors like these, it tends to, as it were, fuel learning. It tends to increase the amount that's learned. And when you've got behaviors that are, you know, the opposite of this, when, for example, people aren't listening, and if you don't listen, then, of course, that's a bit of a handicap to learning effectively. 
Um, if you never ask questions, so you just sit there and never even think of a question, let alone be brave enough to ask one, you know, that tends to reduce relatively the amount you've learned. So these sorts of behaviors, listening of course, asking questions, actually being brave enough to think of ideas, perhaps half-baked ideas, but being brave enough to come up with ideas, exploring ideas, your own ideas, other people's ideas, uh, experimenting, trying different ways of doing things to see what might work best and so on in different circumstances. The whole business of learning from mistakes, and after all, we all make mistakes, quite often in fact, so every mistake from a learning point of view is um, um, a, a very valuable opportunity. Inside every mistake, there are lessons waiting to get out. So mistakes are things, of course, to be learnt from rather than ignored, and we do them again and again. Uh, rev pausing to review our experiences, to reflect, to mull things over, to think about something that's happened, and to draw lessons from it, and then to decide what to do better or differently. Again, not enough time in our busy lives built into pausing to reflect, to ponder, to mull things over. And then, of course, as I've already said on the last one, um, as it were, turning learning in on itself so that we're using the process to improve the process, to get continuously better at, um, at the process of learning, if you like, at the hows of learning, rather than solely concentrating on the what's, which of course are the results that flow from the process. You can't have, you can't have good results if you haven't got a robust sound process. So this is the whole argument is to think of learning as a process or as a skill which can be continuously improved. And finally, I've got one more, one more uh, slide to show you. Um, because you may say, well, okay, so what? Then what is it that we need to do better or differently? It's something that we're presumably not doing now. Otherwise, why would I be encouraging you to help people to become more effective learners? One of the problems, by the way, is if you argue that uh, learning is a natural process, in other words, people don't have to learn to learn, it's just natural, everyone can do it from the word go, one of the problems with that is that it means we take our eye off the learning ball. We sort of let learning run because what's the fuss about? Everybody can do it, so why would you ever spend a moment trying to help someone to be more effective at something they can already do perfectly well? Um, now, the trouble with that, of course, is, as I've tried to show you, that um, there are really quite a lot of problems if you just let learning rip and assume that everyone knows how to do it, how to do it effectively. Because in a way you're half right, because of course people are learning all the time. But my question is, are they learning as effectively as they could? If only we worked out how we could help them to continuously improve the process. So in the end, rather glibly, and there's quite a bit more to it of course than this simple, these simple steps. But the first thing is to treat learning as a skill that needs to be continuously improved, honed and polished something we can get better at, like any other skill. Second is to identify the behaviors we want, because we need to be clear what it is that we want people to do more often than presumably they're doing it now in order to help them to become more effective, to repeat those behaviors more often than they are at the moment. And then, of course, since every behavior is preceded by some event, there has to be some trigger or some cue that brings it into being, then we need to work out, well, how are we going to trigger the behaviors that we want so that people are learning more effectively? And I'm suggesting their behaviors that we saw just a moment ago on the slide before this one. Now, that's only half the story because you could work out how to trigger the behavior, get the behavior, and then if you ignore it, or even if you accidentally punished it, me, I'll give you a, a clear example in a minute, a minute of how easy it is to do that, then of course the behavior will wither and die, it will die out. So it's very important to think of this as a sandwich where we've got the behavior as the filling, the triggers are the, well literally that, they're bringing the behavior into being or maximizing the probability it occurs, no guarantees alas. 
and then you need to lean over backwards to reinforce the behaviors you want so that it's a good experience for the person who's producing the behaviors and therefore there's a tendency for them to repeat those behaviors in similar circumstances when the triggers next occur. And if you think about it, that's absolutely you know, a, a very simple description of the way we all have learnt all the things that we can do. There were triggers, there were, we were reinforced with certain things, punished for other things, we kept going with the things that were encouraged and we tended to sensibly stop doing whatever was discouraged. Um, and an example of how easy it is to, as it were, reward accidentally, not intentionally, to reward the wrong behavior is if you think about what we tend to do when someone admits to a mistake, which is a remarkable thing to do because of what I'm about to describe and about, well, you know exactly what tends to happen. If you go back to school days, for example, when you admit, if you were foolish enough, naive enough to admit to a mistake, so what usually happened if something had gone wrong is you'd blame someone else or blame circumstances. You know, it was never your fault. So if you were foolish enough to admit to a mistake, well, usually what would happen after you had admitted to making a mistake is, well, unpleasant things would happen. You know, you'd get into trouble or you'd be sent to detention or have lines to write or all these other dreadful things that I remember very well. Uh, well, of course, if, if, we're, if we want people to encourage people to admit to mistakes so that they can be learnt from rather than concealed and hidden, then, of course, we would need, when people do this remarkable thing, we would need to lean over backwards, not to point fingers, not to blame, and all the rest of it, so that the business of admitting to a mistake is something which flourishes rather than something that just fizzles out because... Um, there, were, there were adverse consequences, if you like, whenever we admitted to a mistake. So that's why it's so important to have not just the triggers, but also the reinforcers, the things which are going to get the behaviors to stick and to, and to reoccur over and over again. Well, they are. The only trouble with something like that, of course, you know, you finish up with four points. It's, you know, all seems, is it four points? I think it's four, isn't it? It all seems so simple and straightforward. We know, of course, that if we drill down into the detail of what's involved in working out the behaviors we want, in working out, well, what are we going to do to get these behaviors to happen? What are we going to do to reinforce them? You know, there is quite a bit to that, but that's actually, in the end, what it's all about if we're going to help people to be more effective learners than if we just leave them to their own devices. Well, thank you for listening to me. I'm not sure what the time is because I haven't looked. Has anyone got a question they would like to ask? Because I'll gladly try to answer questions. Remembering, by the way, that quest asking questions was on the list just now as one of the behaviors which um, helps us all to be more effective learners. So having reminded you of that, that probably means that no one will ask me a question, of course. <laughs> Any questions? Wait. Oh, two questions. You're falling over yourselves. Yes. Sorry, you talked about um, identifying triggers. What would be the best way or what could you suggest to do that? The, the best... The, well, I, I, again... There's a, there's a lot of detail and there isn't time for it, of course. The best way, actually, is to think about your own behavior and what you can do to maximize the probability that you get the other person to behave you the way you want them to behave. Um, but because it's usually, not always, because there are triggers, you know, can be the physical environment, not just someone else's behavior. But I think the, start, the most profitable starting point is to think about how our behavior can be used to trigger the behavior we want. Because behavior breeds behavior. Uh, there are other things to say about triggers, obviously to do with the environment and all sorts that people feel safe and, you know, and, uh, and all the rest of it. But your behavior is usually the starting point. And it's very interesting how often, unwittingly of course, we are using behaviors which as it were, di either discourage the behavior we want or at least are not encouraging it. So that needs to be thought about. <laughs>
a Twitter web feed or anything like that that I can look have at? Have I got a web page? Yeah. Yes, I have, actually. <laughs> oh, well, I, uh, yes, I, if, if you go to peterhoney.org, that's uh, my, my personal website. And if you go to it, by the way, I'm just thinking of this as a reinforcer. You will be rewarded. Your behavior will be rewarded because many of the things are amusing and many of the things you can, you can have a chuckle at my expense. Many of the things are self-deprecating. Anyway, that's not relevant to helping people to be more effective learners. Oh, I see. Jolly good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Well, there you are then. So now you can go away enlightened, go forth and help people to be more effective learners, starting with yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you.